Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 49th National President of the Navy League of the United States, Mr. Alan Kaplan. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our annual SEER Space Lab. General officers, industry executives, and Navy League members. Before I introduce the secretary, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our Navy League staff. Um, you know, today I think we have close to 1,200 in attendance. We've got a a very agile and robust team, and I'd like to just give our headquarters team a round of applause. Good job. <laughs> Chaplain, thank you for the invocation. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> so today I have the privilege and honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, Secretary Gertz. Secretary Gertz was sworn into office in December 2017. As the Navy's acquisition executive, Mr. Gertz has oversight of an annual budget in excess of $100 billion. He is responsible for equipping and supporting the finest sailors and Marines in the world with the best platforms, systems, and technology as they operate around the globe in defense of our nation. He previously served as the acquisition executive for U.S. Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base, where he was responsible for all special operations, forces acquisition technology, and logistics. Secretary Gertz has over 30 years of extensive joint acquisition experience and he has served in all levels of acquisition and leadership positions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Gertz. It's good, you're about ready to get the hook. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity. How are we doing, gang? Fire it up. All right. Hey, uh, thanks for the opportunity to get here. Before kind of I go through some remarks, I think, Alan, this is your last uh, conference here as the uh, chair. So I would like to applaud, Alan, for all the great work. <clears throat> you know, as we're going through a lot of change in the Department of the Navy, it's, it's great to see the, uh, the Navy League making similar kind of moves, taking some bold moves, uh, not, you know, being caught terribly in the past thinking about the future. And so it's, it's great partnership here. Great to see everybody here. I'll talk for a little while, um, kind of give you an update of where I see things in the Department of the Navy and then leave plenty of time for questions. So if you don't have them, I will have them for you. Uh, I'll start with the front table here if, uh, if you don't have any. So please bring some up. Um, been in a job now about 18 months, hard to believe. Um, and Part of what I want to do today is I'll kind of go through where I think the Navy is going, kind of follow up the CNO's remarks, the under's remarks, uh, but really focus on the amazing things that have occurred, at least for me, in 18 months. You know, sometimes you can, you know, I come coming into the job, oh, it's a Navy, you know, unhampered by 250 years of progress, uh, you know, big, slow, all that kind of stuff. And if you're not careful, you can kind of buy into that. Uh, and you can kind of start using it as an excuse as opposed to thinking of it as an enabler of the awesomeness that is the Department of the Navy, our industrial base, our partners, our allies. Uh, and if you're not careful, you can get focused on, I'll call scarcity thinking, worried about sequestration, worried about BCA, worried about not getting a budget, worried about not getting a contract, worried about not, 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 not as opposed to really looking hard at what do you have and how are you going to be relevant, how are we going to be relevant going into the future. And I would say just as a bumper sticker, I have been incredibly impressed with how fast this organization can turn. We talk about pivot speed, talk some of special operations known for pivot speed, 
it has been amazing how fast we have pivoted on a lot of very important things. For instance, in the last two and a half years, we have saved about $30 billion by improved acquisition strategies. $30 billion, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of capability, right? And it wasn't inventing some obtainium. It was just a lot of hard work working together as a team. I'll talk about here systems that we've accelerated in 18 months by five and six years. That's not because of any big brain, some super acquisition tool. A bunch of O5s and their teams getting together and going working it out. I'll talk about small industry building ships for us, saving us three and four hundred million dollars with just good old ingenuity. And so as we think about everything we need to do, and we've got lots of really, really hard problems, we got to also focus on what do we have? Where are we making success? How do we double down on that? And use that as inspiration and guiding light, not just focus on where we got dark corners. I kind of put this slide up here on the front um, because to me it's another great example of the challenges and opportunities we have, right? On one hand, you got an old battleship, some of you are probably in, a, in the audience, right, when we brought that thing back to war and used it in Desert Storm. So, you know, when you go to war, you go to war with what you got, and you figure out how to use it for what you need. And then up in front, we got a pretty cool little unmanned system that's transited from San Diego to Hawaii and back, perhaps the future. Is it going to do everything the battleship needs to do? Do we need to design like a battleship? Absolutely not. Do we have to figure out how to get those systems so it's not an either or, but an either and, so we can leverage both of them and get them in the hands of the warfighter? Absolutely. All right, and so I can't think of a better picture to kind of set the stage for where we are today. If you can go to the next slide for me. Um, my four kind of priorities for the Department of Navy have not changed. I'm not that smart, I can only remember four things, and if I change it every month, I can't remember, right? And fundamentally, I think this is our recipe for success. Our not being just the military, uh, just the government, all of us. And I think if we continue to focus on these four areas, you're gonna see us continue to accelerate. All right, so my bumper sticker is vectors are all positive. Now we've got to scale and act at speed. All right, we've got the ship pointing in the right direction. Now our collective challenge is to operate at speed. And to you know, pull from the unders talk this morning with relevance, right, and with some with some adaptability, and to focus on the CNOs talk and not get fixated on just counting things, but really focus on what adds power, the power we need for the future. And so I'm going to run through these a little bit with just some examples of where I see things, uh, where we have opportunities. If you go next slide. So first, right. I talk about delivery. I'm a victim of uh, being an acquisition guy that believes in delivering for the warfighter. And so when we talk about delivering, sometimes that converts into counting ships, right? There is an element of delivery about stuff, and we have to constantly deliver capacity to the fleet, but we also have to think about the capability on there and not you know, deliver capability maybe at the same time as capacity and all of that's irrelevant if we're not making that available to the fleet. So a ship at the pier is doing nothing for the fight, right? And so focusing on all those together are really important. Kind of your top left corner there, JLTV, great partnership with the Army. We're gonna deliver that ahead of our objective IOC date. I look forward pretty soon here to turning the first one over to an operational Marine unit. Great partnership with the Army, work together, Working great, the Marines have been doing an awesome job with that program. In the middle, I think this year we are gonna commission 12 ships. I don't think we've commissioned 12 ships in a year in like, since like the 80s. In fact, my wife is asking who my new best friend is named commission because I'm gone every Saturday. But um, that is awesome, right? That is getting tools out in the fleet. LCS, I think we'll have five ships delivered this year. Last time we delivered five of any class, I think was 90s with DDGs, right? So that's capacity out in the fleet. But again, if we, all we focus on is new technology or new things, we're gonna fail. Up in the, uh, your left corner, 
These are folks uh, on our uh, aviation maintenance side, right? Without a whole lot of money, without, you know, a whole lot of assets, they've doubled output in their machine shop, delivering critical spares to the fleet. By all of us focusing together on what does it take to get an 80% mission capable rate and driving in your individual workspaces, these individuals cut in half their flow time, right? And so this idea of flow time and velocity is really, really critical for us uh, to always focus on. Um, down here in the corner, right? Cloud folks, right? That's the new buzz, a lot of things. You see a lot in the press actually practically getting tools out there and converting software, critically important. Get us off these, these big machines. Uh, in the center, Samson, we're really working hard on our ship maintenance. We are not where we need to be on that. But we have great examples of ships delivering early out of availabilities. When we can partner between the industry, the ship captain, and the uh, ship soup, whoever's supervising that on the government side, Great example of us delivering things out to the fleet. And then finally, you think of, you know, Naval Research Lab and building Apollo spaceships and stuff. They're doing some amazing things with very practical output to the fleet. New paints, less corrosion, more environmentally friendly, having an immediate impact on the fleet. And so folks are out there doing this. What's really amazing to me, most of this occurred without any, you know, it wasn't like bright ideas from leadership. This is all at the ground level kind of activity. Really important for us. Second piece is how do we get our pivot speed up, agility? Uh, right, world's changing fast. How do we change at the speed of agility? And so when we think about agility, and go to the next slide for me, right, there's some great examples where we are building agility into the fleet. Where's my F-18 Earth team? I saw some of them out there. They probably didn't want to pay for lunch. So they are in the corner. Um, these cats here teamed up with their squadron made out there in the fleet, delivered IR system four and a half years, four and a half years early to the fleet. How much money did you get? Did you get like a billion dollars to do that? 300,000 bucks, all right? Did I tell you to go do that? No, they went and did it and then it was kind of new. You know, I'm, some of you see me on LinkedIn, I get this out of the blue uh, LinkedIn message from uh, the XO of the squadron saying, hey, your guys are doing great. They're not, they're not uh, afraid to fail. Um, they are making a difference for me and the fleet. That's already shot at Top Gun, all right? Awesome work done at the ground level. Uh, down in the corner, um, we have completely virtualized the Aegis combat system. One of our biggest challenges to maintain the fleet, right, and modernizing the fleet is trying to get all the new combat hardware in there to the point where that Aegis combat system now sits in a Pelican box about yay big. So imagine a future where on your ship you've got your certified combat system, you've got a digital twin of that system with maybe the next test load, so you don't have to take a fleet asset out to go run test, it's doing all the testing for you. Maybe you have the third load with all the weird uh, NRL, whatever, ONR, small business algorithms running on it, all on that same asset to the point where we've taken that digital twin, I call it hot-wired, the Hudner, bypassed all the compute and shot a missile using the uh, organic sensors. All that done within a year for, you know, relatively low dollar amount of things. And so this whole digital twin now bringing a whole nother revolution to our agility. We got agility champions. Uh, man, center here is that crane. I knew him from the special ops world. He's figured out how to leverage all that capability in the warfare center for our special operators. In the corner, a special operator who's coded software himself to help train folks to be JTACs. And then up top, our, uh, our uh, Naval Technology Center. 70, 80, 90 technologies companies all putting them in the hands of the operator, directly going from there to contracts. So as we get our pivot speed up, we stop the you know, inefficient calorie burn. That allows us to free up assets to move forward. Next chart, please. And where we still have work to go as a community is, um, is driving affordability, right? We cannot price ourselves out of relevance. A lot of good work here, um, work to go. In the corner, we uh, 
using kind of new tools and technologies, right? Awarding two aircraft carriers at once saved the government about $4.3 billion, right? F-18, multi-year, negotiated and put on contract without ever sending out an RFP or getting a proposal, say 15 months. Anybody in the industry want to know how much you pay for a proposal on that, right? Three, five million bucks, right? Which we pay in overhead. All that money now can be converted into whatever you believe is the next thing you want to chase in IR&D. So again, when I talk affordability, I'm not talking a percent off of a contract profit line. I'm talking taking fundamental costs out of the system. Down in the corner, going to a small business, opening up new shipyards for some of our smaller ships, had a really, really good small business competition. Last year, Department of Navy uh, sent over $15 billion direct to small businesses as primes. All right, awesome agility out of those. Great affordability. Saved a couple hundred million dollars out of that. In the middle, we're looking at our shipyards, using digital twins to model our shipyards. I saw a couple shipyard COs somewhere out here. All right, I think some of our shipyards, if you count all the steps the workers take every day to get to the workplace, you could walk around the globe once, right? That doesn't add value to product, that's just inefficiency, right? Driving that cost out. And then follow in the corner is uh, an award winner, one uh, I think out of 300 entries, uh, picked for transitioning government technology into industry. So as we continue to drive this affordability piece, right, then we can continue to flow assets into the fleet. Next. And then finally, our, our most important, uh, both opportunity and challenge, is our talent. And I call it our talent. It's not just in the government. It's not just in industry. It's our combined talent. Uh, we have an awesome team. We've got to continue to grow and season that team up. Whether it's in the corner, NAV sub folks getting a great STEM award because they're engaging our youth and getting them interested in the business whether it's the Naval X folks creating a marketplace where we can more quickly share ideas and attract new people here. In the middle, the Marine Corps are using prize challenges to tackle helmet retention issues. Um, in the other corner, in the, in the shipyards, right? Over 50% of our shipyard workers have less than five years experience. We can wait 20 years till they get 25 years experience or do what they're doing now, leveraging technology out there to rapidly accelerate that training and learning. All, right, all this together is enabling us to kind of create that talent we're going to need. Because if you don't think we are in a head-to-head -head competition, right? if you think we're kind of where we were just five years, we are in a match right? where we are not guaranteed the outcome we want. That is not something I'm comfortable with. It's gonna take our collective ability to attract, grow, retain talent, create multitudes of tools so we can get things into fleet quickly, and then work together to take out some of the costs we've got that is a burden in these programs, right? If we're gonna compete and win in the challenges that are facing us uh, as a nation and as a, as a group of countries here. That's where we're heading. Again, I would, I would be, uh, Remiss to, to say it's anything being done at the leadership level. I'm just a big guy with a big neck, right? I just kind of make holes. Uh, I'm really uh, proud of the way everybody's working here together. Uh, but we, you know, vectors are positive. Now we need to scale, right, and do it at speed. And so as I think about being here next year, right, I want to see an exponential growth in this. Uh, I think we've got all the right core material. Uh, but if we don't stay focused on this, leveraging each other's strengths, right, tackling all the, uh, you know, the waste we've got in the system, then we're not going to have the success that I want to deliver here for the nation that I think we need to deliver for the nation. And so uh, my challenge to all of you here is, right, learn. Back to, I think, the under's comments about relevant learning. Right? There is a challenge in our collective system. We all want to be the inventors. 
We all want to be the first innovators. We all want to be the, you know, R&D, rip off and deploy, right? If somebody's the fastest way to get ever thought I was a smart guy at SOCOM, no, I just knew how to steal really well, right? And so we've got to have enough hubris and enough humility, right, that we reward bold action, but we also reward quickly taking what we already have and getting it in the fleet, right? Not being afraid to have something that isn't perfect and putting it in the hands of our warfare so we can figure out what's really important. And so as we think of this agility and speed, that's got to be the focus. How quick can we get, like the F-18 guys, something good enough in the hands of the operator so that they can both use it now and help us better hone where we need to put the next set of resources? Uh, my job for you out in industry is to give you pathways to do that. My job, if you're not in industry but in the government spaces, is clear out the processes right, to enable you to do that. That's what I'm focused on. That's where I think we need to roll. So with that as kind of a state of the current union, I'd be happy to open up to questions or if you want to take me on with anything, uh, bring it on. Or we can finish right now. Sir. Hey, Mr. Secretary, um, thanks so much for your inspirational comments. Uh, I spent some quality time with you at Hack the Machine in Seattle, uh, Kurt Hamill from Esri. Yep. Uh, at the time, you, you gave some really good direction to a small group of people about some valuable exercises, teaming up industry with, uh, with government. One of them was about a cooperative research and development agreement. Can you reiterate that? I thought that was very valuable. It's something that, that many companies, certainly mine, you know, values as that no-cost way of interacting with our Navy customer. Yeah, I've been, um, again, I kind of alluded to the front of this scarcity thinking versus abundance thinking. Uh, and I've been proud to say the Navy is, uh, you know, when I looked at the cooperative R&D stats, um, pretty, um, pretty proactive and the numbers growing. What I like about cooperative R&D agreements is we can bring the best of both to a place. So, for instance, um, if you've got an algorithm that you want us to put on a combat system, if I've got a digital twin, hand me the algorithm, I'll go put it on the weapon system. If you've got a weapon, so if we can start creating these relationships where the barriers to your entry into the market or to get it into test or to get it in front of operators, if I can reduce that barrier, then you can get your products to me faster uh, and more cheaply. And so a cooperative R&D agreement, we think of it too often in a pure S&T role. It actually can play a great role in, uh, in a lot of the products. And so I would ask you to continue to look at the uh, Antexes, our, our naval technology exercises, because that's another tool we use there to quickly uh, quickly go. We got a robot here. Interesting. We'll see where he goes. All right. Lieutenant. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Rich Rodriguez from Naval Postgraduate School. And I'm wondering, sir, how do you see us getting ready or audit ready? And how long do you uh, think that would take us? Yeah, so audit's an interesting thing. And I think sometimes we think of audit too much in a pure financial term. And, uh, and I, I would, I'm, I would guess Secretary Modley probably talked about it some this morning. Um, where I think audit adds value to us is really looking at processes and where do we have, back to this affordability, where do we have waste in the system? So if I have 35 different accounts, is that the right number, Mike, for the E2 program? I think we looked at the E2 program and we had 30, like something like 30 different funding accounts that would, you know, whether it's spares or instrumentation, or, for a program manager to try and synchronize and then somebody to manage, that's probably in, and it's hurting our head from an audit standpoint, that's probably an indicator where we have opportunity from a process standpoint to clarify roles and missions. So I think as long as we stay focused on that and don't get too overly focused on an accounting, I mean, there's an accounting element of it, I look at it much more from the, hey, if it's really hard for me to figure out what's really going on, that's probably not the process that we need going into the future. And so that's where I think the audit's really gonna pay a benefit. Thank you, sir. All right, so the, uh, the robot just asked me a question. This is Scooby, by the way. Anybody met Scooby from NAVSUP? Wants to know how to overcome the fear of technology taking away things from the workforce. <laughs> Good question. Um, so again, kind of back to CRADA, we were talking about CRADA, and I don't know who makes, I guess, tag surveyor makes this product, right? 
So here's a product I'm sure being used in the commercial world. Uh, right now, we probably have humans doing inventory in warehouses. I would much rather have those humans do what humans do really good job, thinking about something, inventing something, making hard decisions, not going and checking boxes. And so our trade is, right, how do we use technology where technology makes sense, right? And don't look at it as a threat, but look at it as an opportunity to free up, I go back to this abundance thing, free up resources to go tackle the hard problems we have. And so, you know, our, it's, it's tough, all right? Everybody, the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet diaper, right? Nobody, and everybody likes to be the changer and not the changee, right? So it's very easy for me to say, hey, let's change and get ready now. I mean, again, there's a human element to it. But I think as we think about technology and speed, there's no reason I need to put an RFP out for a custom inventory RFP, RFID reader, right? So we shouldn't burn calories on that. We ought to figure out, do a CRADA, do a quick discovery if it exists, put it in a warehouse, try it out on a pilot if it works, repurpose those individuals for something else. That's where we've got to get to as a community and do that quickly. So there is a element of, you'll hear the secretary talk about urgency. I talk about iteration speed, right? How fast can we cycle it? Because we waste a lot of money in flow. Back to that, uh, one of the biggest things we found in looking at the Navy readiness, we were spending tremendous amounts of resources and dollars and people in things in flow where things could have been done much faster, right? You know, we have a, you know, for $5,000, we could put, put a new wireless box in so the reception's 10 times as good and folks wouldn't sit there and wait for their machine, right? So those are things we've just got to go off and do and not think too hard about. We do have a little tendency to nuke things here in the Navy. All right, next question. Thanks, Scooby. Mr. Secretary, Rick Easton. I actually have a two-pronged question. Uh-oh, I got a small brain. Yes, sir. I think you can handle both of these, though. Uh, first of all, fundamental costs. If you just scratch the surface, how much fundamental cost is there out there? And the second question is, we've done uh, several things in the past, certainly not on the scale I think you're doing them now, to, to act, acquire things more rapidly. In the 90s, we tied up a couple of cruisers. So my question is, is do you have any concern um, about we move so fast that we end up hurting combat capability? Are you putting any things in place to make sure that as we move this quickly, we still, in fact, get, particularly on large programs, things that require a lot of interoperability, the systems that we do, in fact, need to fight? Yeah, so, so good questions. That's where I kind of like iteration speed, right? And so uh, what tended to happen in the big services Again, looking from afar and when I was in the Air Force, if you're not careful on these big programs, they're very transactional. The requirements guys go in a room somewhere and they work for five years and they come up with a glorious requirements document. And then that gets walked across the hallway and it's given to the acquisition guys and they work for five years and they create a glorious solution, which then gets walked back to a different set of requirements guys and the world's changed. And then we go test it. And then finally it gets into the fleet sometimes later. So, so the first thing I would say is, and like you're seeing us do on MQ-25 and Frigate, driving a informed requirements discussion to include industry, to include critical government technology if we're bringing it in there, is absolutely crucial, right? And then getting that spinning as fast as you can. Um, that doesn't mean reckless, right? So that's where I kind of go back. I like velocity, not speed, right? Because you can rush off and go in a completely wrong direction uh, without enough checks and balances in the system. It is hard with big programs because they're like a big flywheel, they get inertia and then they're hard to stop and move on. Um, but we also need to think about how new technology can solve old problems. So I kind of like the Eisenhower quote, right? If you can't solve the problem, make it harder, right? And so, you know, it's really hard to update an old cruiser. So we can either keep recognizing it's hard or say, okay, good, you only have two weeks to go do it. How would you do it? Maybe you're gonna use a digital twin and you're gonna hotwire a bunch of stuff. Or maybe you're going to say, hey, we just don't need that anymore, um, and have that kind of deliberate discussion. Uh, the second piece is I spent a lot of time on big programs with trying to understand the fundamental assumptions, because where I found most big programs go south is the fundamental assumption changed and somebody didn't detect it. And so having kind of that revisit is really important. And then finally, I would say on the sustainment side where we have a lot, 
we have a lot of cost in sustainment. We have a lot of cost in sustainment. And where we apply lots of, you know, save $30 billion by applying lots of great acquisition tools, you know, block buys and economic order quantity buys and two carrier buys, on the front end, we don't employ the same level of thinking, applying tool sets on the back end of programs. And so we've actually, uh, Mike Moran and I, we've changed, we're gonna do gate seven reviews, right? So a, a gate review is where the CNO and I look at a program on a periodic basis to make sure the requirements are still relevant and the solutions still, we're gonna start looking at programs that are in sustainment, i.e. cruiser, right? Because once we kind of, you know, if you're not careful, we kind of throw it over the fence where 70% of the cost sits and then, okay, it's a fleet problem, we're not gonna deal with it anymore. I think that's a failure on the acquisition prior. And so the other piece you're gonna see is program teams owning a program for the life of the program and getting away from throwing it over the fence. Because the really smart teams can employ a bunch of tools if I have a sustainment issue and a new capability, I can get two first if, I, if I've got those coupled the right way. And that's where you and industry can help, right? either by architectures or by new solutions. Uh, and then the, the last element, um, we're doing a lot more thinking about, I'll say putting catcher's mitts in programs. Uh, because right now, you know, if a new technology comes out of ONR or through SIBR or something else, we're like, okay, great. We'll see you in five years once we get it in the budget, right? So the getting through to the program of record is a really hard leap. And so a lot of work we're doing right now is to get the impedance mismatch down so these new programs can absorb technology from wherever it comes much more quickly and much more affordably. Because we can't scale up the old way of doing business to operate in the new world. We're just, there's no way, it doesn't matter how fast you, you, you can't get there. And so that's where we're kind of doing some fundamental replumbing uh, to get after it. All right, sir. Hey, sir, Don Klein, former uh, Navy guy. I got a question for you about other transaction authorities, OTAs. So we're Corporately, we're pretty all in on it and have leveraged quite a few. There's some rumblings here in D.C. that Congress is not as enamored of OTAs maybe as uh, the services and industry is. So question is, do you, 18 months to two years from now, do you think OTAs are still going to be around or is there going to be a stake driven through maybe through, through some uh, external influences? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is, you know, kind of what's the future of OTAs? I think like any tool, a tool's good for a job. Our responsibility is finding the right way to apply that tool to a job. The knock, I would say, in a lot of cases, we are, we are doing it, what looks like a FAR Part 15 contract, calling it an OTA and declaring victory, right? Or we're running around telling everybody we're gonna do an OTA so nobody can protest it, right? And we're, so we're using it in the, so the cases where I'm seeing OTA used for the right purpose, hey, we want to have you know, a consortium. We've got a team right now looking at how do I do a SIBR award under an OTA that can carry me all, all the way through low rate initial production on that same contract vehicle. So my sense with the Hill is when we think critically about a tool, use it thoughtfully, we might pilot a bunch of different ways to do it and scale it in a, in a in a thoughtful manner, whether it's OTAs or 804, all that, I got all the support in the world we need. If we kind of just, okay, let's, you know, everybody search and replace something with OTA or use it recklessly, um, then I, that's where I think we're rightly uh, concerned. I think we'll be okay with the Hill as long as um, we're, we're communicating and, and using it in the proper way. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks. Other questions? Sir, I can repeat it if they can't hear you. Brian Thomas, TMW 120. Between me at the deck plate for Navy acquisition and you at the top, how do you solve the frozen middle? All right, the, uh, the dreaded frozen middle question, right? So everybody who thinks they're at the bottom worried about the frozen middle, write down what you hate about the frozen middle, put it in an envelope, and when you get promoted, open it up and see how many you're doing, All right? <laughs> you know. So, I mean, everybody hates your higher headquarters. That's just the kind of the way of life. Um, here's what I would say on the, the frozen, right? The, I, I kind of, I think we oversell that sometimes. Um, we need to have coherence through all of the ranks. The way I'm attacking it, you know, all my direct reports you probably heard, the first thing I rate them on is they have to have a major initiative that's got a 50% chance of failing. 
Now, judgment's encouraged, so I'm not like, don't pick the law, right? Don't pick ethics. Maybe not the mission we're doing tonight. But I have found if we don't challenge ourselves in that manner, and if I don't challenge folks, if I don't rate them on their ability to try and take bold moves, right, then I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing what I'm saying. Um, I think our corporate challenge, right, the, the middle layer, well, they got to deliver every day. So, you know, we're trying to build a culture that says, you know, create enough bandwidth where you can deliver today and try new things. Um, but if you're at the deck plate level out there, don't give, don't give your leadership that much power. And I'm a little bit serious about that, right? What bold moves are you taking up? And are, have you thought through them and are you fighting for them? All right? My job is to create the culture where those can fight their way through. Um, but your job at your level, keep pressing, right? Keep pressing ahead. And, and again, if we can't differentiate the work and figure out what work do we have to do with high confidence or return on a certain schedule, where do we want to take risk and move boldly, right? We're not doing our job. And where I want us to create between us, industry, everybody, acquisition programs are the ones that have all those blends. There's some elements, you know, when I'm building a submarine that's going to last 50 years, I'm probably going to take a little time on the hull and the nu nuclear plant. On the algorithm and the sonar, that ought to be changing every 18 months. And so the programs that I see of the future are the ones that can blend both of those, right? They're ambidextrous. They can both have some things that are longer cycle time that deliver with credibility, if you're a structure or something, and then inside you've got it churning like tomorrow. And if we can reduce the iteration cost and iteration speed, get that up, then you can afford to do both. If all of our, you know, you know, explorations take as long as building the whole ship, we're never going to be able to afford to be able to explore things outside doing the ship. All right, and so I need teams that are thinking on both of those levels. And then we've got to create business and technical architectures that allow that to happen. All right, good question. Anything else? Once, twice. Oh, one more, all right. Yeah, so the question was, how do you create incentives? Um, I think we have the ultimate incentive of, if we want to stay around, we got to figure this out. That won't get through all the middle plate right away. I, I, think the, uh, I think part of the incentive, and if you're in the operational side, it's also this, I've talked a lot about acquisition. I think the owners talked about learning, right? We've got to think about it all the way to the 05 that's got a ship and he or she, if they aren't motivated to be exploring, if they aren't pulling from the system, right? You can get the, I've done it, I've got the acquisition system humming, and then you don't have the absorption rate, right, to get that out in the field. And so, if you're in industry, um, or even on the government side, we very much undervalue simplicity, right? We love complex stuff. The problem with complex stuff is it's got a huge absorption rate issue in the fleet, right? And if we're not careful, you know, it takes so long to build because it's very complex and it takes so long to turn, then nobody can maintain it and then it dies of its own. And so where we've got to continue to, I would say, compress the distance between supplier and user, some would call it design thinking, some would call it, I mean, you've got lots of different buzzwords. And you can, again, compress the cycle time so you can move faster, right? Then I, you know, when folks see what they're doing is relevant, I mean, you look in the back corner here, right? The, the folks there are fired up because the fleet trusts them to deliver something quickly that may not work perfectly. They trust the fleet that they're not going to call, you know, 911 and everybody, the acquisition failed because the thing they did in two weeks didn't work perfectly. When you get that trust working and you get that give and take, then we can do incredible things. You talk unmanned systems. You know, and somebody asks, well, how do you know exactly how it's, I, I have no idea how exactly it's going to work. I just know if I can get them into the hands of sailors faster, they will tell me how they think it might work or how we, we need it to work. And then we can do a much more uh, thoughtful iteration step. If I wait for 15 years to figure out perfectly how we think it's going to work and then wait to then to deliver them a product, I'll guarantee you it's not right. 
And so that's how I think you incentivize folks. When, when, you know, when we're mission focused and everybody sees you know, a system that's got trust and outcome, then we can, do great, we can do great things. And that goes for industry, right? If I can't, you know, I would rather us build a prototype and go fly them than you spend $10 million on a piece of paper proposal, right? A proposal tends to not add any value into the system. And so that's why we're, we're exploring all these different tools uh, to figure out how do, we, how do we do that. Naval X, a lot of that whole effort is really to mobilize tools, right? So that you don't have to teach the frozen middle how to do a prize challenge. They just need to know, hey, here's my prize challenge. Call these guys, they'll do it for you, right? And get out of this, everybody's got to learn it and get comfortable with it and invent it. No, somebody needs to be really good at prize challenges and whoever's got one, whether you're in the fleet or you're in a program office or they know who to go, they'll go execute it quickly. That's another way to break down this frozen middle of learning from each other. That's why I love Kratos. That's why I love experimentation venues because the cost to get together to learn something is really low. So that means you can do a lot of it on rapid iteration speed. And then if we can back it up with the acquisition system to buy what we need at the point with a fleet, that will take an experiment with it. That's how we get our collective speed up. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Hope you have a great conference.